Welcome to the seventh annual Think Investing Conference. What a wonderful site this is. We have a lot of seasoned investment professionals, but alongside all of you, we have energetic uh, young people on the brink of launching their careers. My name is Lori Santikin. I am a professor of finance and strategy here at UCLA Anderson. I am also the director of our Fink Center for Finance and Investments. Together with the Anderson Investment Association and our student directors, uh, Bauman Mirzahi, Hannah Green, Spencer May, Yan Yu, and Janelle Zhu, I am thrilled to welcome you to campus for a fun and educational afternoon uh, with your peers and soon to be peers. The Fink Center for Finance and Investment serves as a bridge connecting academic and practitioner insights on the broad world of finance. We're excited to have several leading practitioners join our esteemed faculty this afternoon for thought-provoking discussion on financial markets. To kick off our program, we have Jay Wintraub, CEO of Oak Tree Capital. Oak Tree Capital Management is a global alternative investment management firm with expertise in credit strategies. They have over 120 billion in assets under management and over 900 employees around the world. Quite impressive. Uh, however, they started off as a small entrepreneurial venture by a few founders, founders. And this is something that resonates very strongly with our students at Anderson, where the entrepreneurial bug is very contagious, even among our finance students. Jay joined Oak Tree in 2014 as Oak Tree's first CEO after being founder-led for two decades. Jay is a lawyer by training, a proud graduate of UC Berkeley. Uh, he's a double bear, if you will, having earned both his bachelor's and law degrees from Cal. Uh, Jay, you know, if anyone gives you a hard time about that, uh, just, just, I'll protect you. I went to Berkeley too. Prior to Oak Tree, Jay served as president and CEO of AIG Life and Retirement, president of Sun America Investments, and also practiced as an attorney early in his career. So we're thrilled that you could join us today, Jay. Without further ado, let's welcome Jay Wintraub. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. It's um, really a privilege to be here uh, today with everybody. Um, I'll start with a couple of thank yous. I want to thank Dean Olian, who I didn't get a chance to see today, uh, Lori, um, and my dear, dear friend Jill Baldoff for inviting me here to speak. Um, UCLA and the Anderson School uh, are two remarkable institutions uh, that I hold near and dear, both because I had two brothers who graduated from UCLA, and I also had the chance to serve on the board of the Anderson School from 1997 to 2004. And, uh, as Lori mentioned, as a uh, loyal Cal Golden Bear, I can honestly say that UCLA is my second favorite Pac-12 school. Um, so when I was asked to talk um, and allowed to talk about almost anything, um, uh, I just wanted to start out uh, and sort of focus on three things. I'm going to talk briefly about Oak Tree Capital Management, the firm that I'm very privileged and fortunate to be the CEO of. I want to talk about, secondly, the very bright growth prospects for the investment management industry, and in particular, alternative investments. Uh, then thirdly, maybe a few remarks about the markets and where we are in the cycle and where we might be headed. And then I look really forward to taking questions about anything from anyone uh, at the end of my talk. So uh, let's jump into this, see if I can figure out how to use the clicker. Uh -huh. Lori covered my first slide, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, Oak Tree is a leading global alternative asset manager. We manage a little over $120 billion. Uh, we're global. We're public. Uh, the firm tilts towards credit strategies. About 70% of our assets are in credit. Uh, we're global. We operate in 18 cities. And at the center of Oak Tree, we're very fortunate to have uh, 2,300 clients, including really a blue, blue chip roster of the largest public and private pension funds, insurance companies, uh, sovereign wealth funds, university and endowments, and family offices, high net worth individuals around the globe. And they are the centerpiece, of course, of what we do at Oak Tree. Um, Dean Olian invited me to speak and give a guest lecture in her class. In, she, that's why I was hoping to bump into her. Uh, in 2008, um, and I spoke at that time on the topic of ethical leadership. No laughter, please. Um, but interestingly, I didn't know it then, there's 
probably was a connection between what I talked about at that guest lecture um, and where I ended up at Oak Tree. I think that Oak Tree is sort of the rare firm in our industry guided by a, uni a unified investment philosophy and a set of business principles that are really the same today as when the firm was started by our founders, Howard Marks and Bruce Karsh, 23 years ago. And it reminds me of um, one of the, the things that Warren Buffett says, and he says so many great things. Uh, quote, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently, close quote Warren Buffett. I've got to believe that Howard and Bruce did think about that when setting out the firm's guiding principles 23 years ago. When I first got to Oak Tree, um, I asked our management team how they answered the question when it was asked of them by their daughters or sons or parents or friends, what is Oak Tree? And I got a lot of good answers, all of which were inconsistent and overly complex. So I said, let's come up with a mission statement, try to boil this all down, and we have to deliver superior investment results with risk under control and to conduct ourselves and our business with the highest integrity. And that's really what all of our investment philosophy points and our business principles are all about. I want to talk about a few of them just to give you a sense of the flavor and the culture of Oak Tree. Um, we believe in the primacy of risk control. Many people think of Oak Tree as the risk control asset manager. Uh, so what does that all mean? Uh, well, superior performance is really not our primary goal at Oak Tree. Rather, it's really superior performance um, with a commensurate amount of risk, or less than a commensurate amount of risk. Our view is that achieving good performance in good times really is not the way you measure a manager's skill or success. It takes good performance in bad times to prove that those good time gains were earned through skill and not simply through taking risk or good luck. Um, we place a high, high priority on preventing losses and believe especially in the risky markets in which we invest. If we avoid the losers, the winners will take care of themselves. And that applies in spades to investing in credit where for the most part, paper is purchased at par. The most you can get back is par. And so you have a lot more to lose than you have to gain. Um, we also emphasize consistency at Oak Tree. We constantly talk with our teams about the fact that a long series of modestly above average years leads to a time period of well above average performance. Uh, the story is told around the firm about a CIO of one of our large pension clients who at his retirement dinner touted the fact that in his 18 year career as a CIO, he'd never been higher than the 26th or lower than the 49th percentile in annual performance. But over the 18 year period, that put him in the fourth percentile of performance of all equally sized pension funds. And that's a good way to sum up our view of why consistency is extremely important in the business we're in. We focus on less efficient markets. Um, uh, put another way, we stick to alternatives. You're not gonna find oak tree folk, uh, focusing on large liquid public stocks and bonds, trying to compete against um, computer controlled investors uh, or others, we'll stick to the less efficient markets. And the primary reason for that is uh, we are not a top down macro forecasting, um, predicting the future kind of firm. We're bottom up fundamental security ana analysts. And it's only really in the less efficient markets today where hard work and skill and fundamental analysis can make a difference. Uh, we have no economist, we have no global market strategist, we don't have any firm view about the future of interest rates or currencies or volatility or market sentiment. Um, we just believe in basically skill and hard work, security by security, piece of real estate by piece of real estate, evaluating business by business. Um, Howard Marks, our co-founder, often tells the story of there being two types of forecasters the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know that they don't know. And to quote Howard, quote, if you're getting your information from a forecaster, the fact that he was right once doesn't tell you anything. The views of that forecaster would not be of any value to you unless he was right consistently. And nobody's right consistently and avoids making deviant forecasts. So the bottom line is that forecasting is not valuable. And that's something that my experience, Howard's, has told me. Um, 
when it comes to our business principles, it's all about uh, a series of practices and policies that make sure that we act with integrity. And it really starts by remembering that the client is at the center of everything we do. I've never been involved in a business that has such a client-centric culture as Oak Tree. I've been involved in many businesses that talk about the clients, and it's important what, uh, that we serve the clients, and they really meant that. But I've never seen it as ingrained throughout the culture as at Oak Tree. Uh, we believe in having as much of a commonality of interest with our clients as possible, treating them fairly, providing them with very transparent communications and very fair and explicit fee arrangements. Uh, we often talk about uh, following the don't do it if you wouldn't be comfortable reading about it on the front page of the New York Times test. That is a good way to describe the basic culture at Oak Tree. And then the second thing I'll mention about business practices is that really we view the profitability of the firm and the success of the firm as having to remain dependent on delivering good investment performance. We really know that we're running the business for the benefit of our clients and all of our clients' constituents, the pension and insurance policy beneficiaries, the 401k beneficiaries and participants, all the philanthropic causes that rely on funding from foundations and endowments, the general populace in many countries uh, that are supported by government sovereign wealth funds, as well as for, of course, our employees and our shareholders. But our view is that profit without performance, bigness for its own sake, even prosperity through cost cutting, they're really all explicitly rejected at Oak Tree. Our earnings and profitability should grow if we achieve excellence in investing, but only then. I want to shift now to taking a look at the industry more broadly, and I try to put on a piece of paper what I think of as some of the most important reasons that the industry has grown and will continue to grow in the future. Uh, starting with uh, lower for longer interest rates, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, ever since uh, central banks around the world uh, engaged in uh, historic easing activities post-global financial crisis, we all know interest rates have come down to historically low levels. But the fact is that most of our clients um, had always earned their necessary, call it 7 to 8 percent returns that a lot of their balance sheets are predicated on by investing in traditional asset classes. And they can't do that anymore. They can't do that with investment grade bonds. Uh, and prospective returns on uh, large cap stocks, I don't know if that's really where they're going to be in the, in, in the future. And so more and more investors, global institutional investors, have allocated more and more to alternatives because they believe they're in exchange for, in some cases, liquidity or in exchange for carefully taking increased amounts of risk, they can achieve the returns they need to meet their own obligations. Then there's demographics, more older people living longer and needing to plan and save for a much longer lifetime. Uh, everyone's heard the statistics, a couple of my favorites. A 65-year-old woman alive today um, is expected to live to 90. Uh, a couple, both 65, married today, 50% chance one lives to 92, 25% chance one lives to 97. That's wonderful, uh, but it's also very, very expensive in terms of assets and income needed to maintain a decent standard of living. So many people are saving more, and over time, savings translates in large part to investments. And really, these longer lifespans are the key reason that our social safety nets are fraying. Pensions are underfunded. Social Security and other entitlement programs basically are broke mathematically. And this is, of course, the third rail of American politics. No politician wants to get involved for fear of failing to get reelected. But what we've seen is that more and more from the boomer generation, Gen Xers, millennials, they actually understand this phenomenon. And more of them are taking greater personal responsibility for their financial future and actually saving more. And again, over time, a lot of that savings translates into investments. I mentioned here the retailization of retirement savings, uh, defined benefit to defined contribution and money in motion finally to individual retirement accounts. This is one of the reasons that more and more of even the alternative firms traditionally focused on institutional investors, such as Oak Tree, have also started to grow meaningfully sized 
retail platforms. And I think that will grow more and more in the future as retail clients want to find ways to gain access to heretofore hard to access alternative investments. Then there's the proliferation and growth of sovereign wealth fund assets. And people in the United States, not in our business, don't think about this much because the United States doesn't have a sovereign wealth fund. But around the world, assets under management and sovereign wealth funds now total $7.5 trillion, up 13% in one year. $5.5 trillion of that is in just 10 funds. And half of that total is from hydrocarbon funded sovereign wealth funds, call it the Gulf in large part. So growing sovereign wealth funds are fueling, no pun intended, growth in assets under management in our industry. Then there's the growth of the middle class and frankly also wealthier class in developing countries. And there's no question that China and India are leading the way. Uh, as we see more and more of this happening, we see more savings in these countries. And again, more and more of these savings winding their way towards investments. And then finally, I just want to mention that Another big trend that's happening is fewer and fewer of the large institutional clients are putting out mandates or RFPs for individual investment strategies. More and more of them fighting off the trend for lower for longer are asking for investment managers to provide solutions, to provide outcomes. A little bit of the, we don't really care how you get there, but we need to get there. And so they're looking for multi-strategy uh, solutions, and that's another big part of growth in our industry multi-strat diversified credit products would be a good example at Oak Tree. A little bit about alternatives versus the rest of the asset management industry. Um, on the left side of this slide, you see that um, the asset management industry today is well over $215 trillion of assets managed for a fee worldwide. And that number is expected to grow to about $350 trillion by the end of 2025. That's about a 5% compounded annual growth rate. And you can see that sovereign wealth funds are expected to grow at the fastest rate among the different client types. And that individuals, both high net worth and mass affluent, control the largest pool of assets. And at the same time that those client AUM are expected to grow at a 5% CAGR, alternative assets on the right-hand side are expected to grow almost twice as fast, about 9% to $21 trillion. So, Lots of, in, uh, lots of opportunity for those of us in alternative investments in the years ahead. And the growth rates are really strongest in what I call the traditional alternatives. And uh, stop for a second, alternative investments used to mean, in my mind, you know, private equity and hedge funds. Um, but now alternative investments is a burgeoning, broad classification. But the, uh, uh, the traditional strategies, such as private equity and private debt, they're going to grow the most in absolute terms. You can see that here on this slide. But there are niche asset classes, such as infrastructure, that are going to be growing the fastest in the years ahead. And especially if um, state, local, federal governments uh, help facilitate public-private partnerships, they could grow even faster. Interestingly, the more liquid alternative investment strategies, like hedge funds, they're currently expected to have the slowest growth rates. And I don't know if that's just because of the last few years of modest performance by hedge funds or, uh, or some broader trend. But I think that people are recognizing the value of trading off liquidity to some extent and taking some incremental risk with skilled professional managers in exchange for a return versus the broad, liquid public markets. When it comes to geographies, uh, different parts of the world are focused on different alternative strategies. So private equity in green here is clearly the king across all geographies. Private equity holds more than half of the alternative assets around the globe. North America is the largest investor in alternatives. But in terms of a growth rate and opportunities, clearly the fastest growing segment is probably Asia PAC, especially China. And that's where Oak Tree has been spending a lot of its fundraising efforts and growing its platform. I just got back again from Beijing and Hong Kong and Singapore. And the activity level there among the sovereign wealth funds, now we're starting to see it more uh, among the insurance companies and even among wealth managers who are distributing more and more to high net worth clients in China. The activity there is very high and frankly, it's very exciting. I was also in Japan on this trip 
And uh, if you haven't heard of the Government Pension Investment Fund, the GPIF, that is the largest pension fund in the world, $1.4 trillion in assets, they're, they're readying their very first allocation to alternative investments with a stated goal of to grow that to between 25 and 5% on a $1.4 trillion base. So it's actually a very, very exciting time globally uh, to see the potential growth there for those of us who can you know, meet the needs of those clients with the products they're looking for. And that's why in terms of fundraising for Oak Tree and I think for the industry, um, there's a higher growth rate of alternative assets being raised outside of North America. So on this slide, I think you see the growth rate for North American fundraising is about 6% uh, going forward. But the expected growth rate in the Middle East, Latin America, and especially in Asia Pacific is almost double that at 9%. And a lot of that is not just growth in assets. It's really uh, geographies increasing their allocations to alternatives, whereas the US and Europe in particular have been allocating there for quite some time. And for Oak Tree on the right, you can simply see that that's reflected in our experience. Over half of our fundraising dollars last year came from Asia Pacific and Europe and the Middle East. Uh, we only have about 20%, 29% of our total assets from outside the US. So to be selling at a faster growth rate in a given year than that just shows that that's where the, the growth is in terms of fundraising. Another trend in our industry, uh, uh, size matters. The bigger getting bigger, the mega firms are growing the fastest. On the left side of the slide here, you see that the mega firms are grabbing more fundraising dollars, and they're gaining more and more market share within our industry. And a lot of this growth is focused on private equity, where in the last three or four years, we've read about several of the mega firms raising mega funds. And I think it's going to be very interesting for our industry over the next five to 10 years to see how these recent cohorts of very, very large PE funds perform, especially trying to deploy um, in this investment environment and at these valuation levels. I think we're well positioned at Oak Tree on the right-hand side. I'm not sure we're really a mega firm. I think I guess we're a pretty large firm. Um, uh, but one of the things that we think about often, and Lori mentioned at the beginning about uh, an entrepreneurial firm versus, uh, I guess, a, a mega firm, is that there's a lot of evidence out there that growth in AUM, if not done carefully, is really often the enemy of superior fund performance. And at some firms, in fact, historically, being a successful alternatives manager was defined by showing the clients that each fund you raised was bigger than the last one. That was the definition of success. Uh, even though the performance of the larger funds ultimately wasn't as good oftentimes, not always, as the smaller funds. Um, and that's where at Oak Tree I think we're a little bit different. Uh, we really don't believe in growth for growth's sake as much as our unit holders would like, to, like us to on a given day. Um, and there have been many occasions where we've turned down commitments because we believe we are at capacity in terms of good investment opportunities. We like to tell people that we raise funds commensurate with the opportunity set to invest them. Um, others in the firm sometimes say we're an asset manager, not an asset gatherer. Um, and really, the, re the reason that's occurred in the last few years is twofold. Um, we've taken advantage, maybe to a greater extent than most, and continue to do so, of ample liquidity, low rates, lots of dry powder in the issue, in the industry, very high valuations to sell portfolio assets uh, at an accelerated pace. And as you sell assets, that puts a lid on AUM growth. And then secondly, our pace of deployment, which continues steady, has been modest. And that's because to be disciplined and seek the rates of return we are, uh, we're seeking, uh, there just haven't been as many opportunities and in, at, as in other periods of time. Um, and so you can see on the lower right-hand part of this uh, slide that Oak Tree is the opposite of a successful alternative asset manager because this is the fundraising pattern for our probably best-known strategy, distressed debt. And it's basically all over the map, small, large, medium, large, small. And that's because each one of these funds, which independently I think has done reasonably well performance-wise or very well, was raised in, with the thought in mind of how we could invest over the subsequent two, three, four years in the kind of things we wanted to invest in. And what we found from our clients is that if you do a good job investing a small fund and you return capital and profits, they're a lot easier to make a call on them to ask for them to give you money back when you see a larger investment opportunity. 
And so keeping the clients pleased with the investment performance, regardless of the size of the fund, and showing that you know how to sell as well as to buy, um, is a good long-term strategy. It takes a lot of patience, takes a lot of discipline. It's probably more difficult to do as a public company. Uh, but at Oak Tree, I think we pride ourselves on, on doing it that way. Another trend I want to point out for the industry is that private credit has absolutely exploded. Uh, and that's the growth rate, the 13% compounded growth rate in private credit. And again, two primary reasons for this. Uh, following the global financial crisis, which was a big event for many reasons, um, much, much stiffer lending standards were imposed by the federal regulators, and much, much higher capital requirements on certain types of loans were imposed. And as a result, a lot of the banks, especially the medium and regional banks, withdrew or retrenched from lending to small and middle market businesses. Instead, they chose to allocate the capital they had to the large syndicatable bank loans, uh, which they could uh, uh, be part of the origination, get some of the uh, uh, origination fees, and syndicate most of. Uh, but secondly, of course, low rates. I won't repeat the reasons for that. But as we've had lower for longer, more and more of investors have looked to private debt where they're trading off liquidity for some improvement in the rates they can earn and some, definitely some improvement in the covenants they can get to protect them as, as lenders. The public market covenants have all but disappeared. And so again, on the left-hand side, you see 13% growth in private debt. That's against 9% growth for all alternatives, as I mentioned earlier. And I think we're well positioned at Oak Tree, given that we have a big credit tilt to our uh, asset mix, over 70% in credit. For the last formal part of the presentation, I want to shift over to um, talking a little bit about where we are in the markets today. And uh, in thinking about how to present this, I sort of divided up all my thinking between tailwinds, headwinds, and wild cards confronting investors. And I have to admit that it's been feeling more recently like the headwind and wild card columns have been growing the fastest. But starting with the positives, we are in the middle of a very good economy. Very, very strong, synchronized growth globally. globally. Strong corporate earnings that could well get stronger. The stimulus from the tax cuts and the repatriation of foreign profits um, has not fully flowed through the economy. Um, CapEx expenditures are probably going to increase. And basically, just the pro-business attitude and the actions of Congress and the current administration are all very, very positive signs. And it's going to take something pretty material to turn that around. Uh, and, I, and, and this is really a, a very strong economy and a pro-business environment. Um, at the same time, there's a lots of things to be potentially concerned about. Some of them are sort of known and staring us in the face, and some of them are a little more remote. So let me talk about a few of those. I mean, I guess everybody knows that to some extent asset prices are pretty high, meaning prospective returns are pretty low. Um, we also know that the monetary policy, especially here in the United States, is tightening. The punch bowl of quantitative easing is being taken away. Some of the other stimulus measures around the globe are going to be cut back. That's going to put upward pressure on interest rates. And it's all been one great experiment uh, to, to uh, reliquify the global economy. It will be a bit of an experiment uh, to take away the punch bowl. We'll see how that turns out. Uh, it reminds me of another good Buffett saying. He said, uh, quote, interest rates act on financial valuations like gravity acts on matter. The higher the rate, the greater the downward pull. And it's pretty simple. Higher rates are uh, are a challenge for the markets. Um, uh, there's also, in our view, a lot of complacency in these markets. Uh, not as much caution as you'd expect, given a number of factors, one of which is just the surge in the amount of debt outstanding around the globe. In the developed markets, the emerging markets, the frontier markets, the amount of debt outstanding is at all-time highs. Um, uh, and, and, and a lot of that isn't as felt as much because rates are so low, and debt service coverage costs are so low, you don't feel it. But the amount of outstanding is at all-time highs. And a lot of that is um, with little covenant protection, is low quality. One of my favorite examples is what's happening in some of the emerging markets. So it, just in the last 18 months, you may or may not know, I don't think you own this issue, that Kazakhstan issued a billion and a half dollar of 10-year debt to yield 4%. 
and another billion of 30-year paper to yield just over 5%. That's your Kazakhstan GEO paper. Or Argentina last year issued north of a billion dollars of 100-year bonds. Of course, anyone who follows Argentina knows they've defaulted three times in the last 23 years. Uh, the market soaked up this paper quickly because you can get the incremental 50, 100, 150 basis points. And uh, lower for longer uh, gets people um, to do that. I like to say that one has to wonder whether the need or greed for yield has overcome the fear of not being repaid. And then there's the wild card column. Uh, these are things that I don't know if they're going to happen or not. You, might, you have better views on it probably than me, but it's possible. Certainly higher inflation, especially at a time when the stimulus from the tax cuts is just kicking in. Trade war, tariffs, geopolitical risks, enough said. And our, I like to say our non-traditional president. Um, these are all things that are wild cards. We don't know how they'll play out. Um, but they're fairly obvious. The only thing that isn't obvious is at what order of magnitude they'll appear. Um, but if they do appear, any one of these is going to have a materially adverse impact uh, on business activity in the markets. Then I think there's some others that we know of but aren't so obvious that could be big. I still think that implementation of technology regulations or user blowback against a Facebook or others could be a big issue. And the reason is not because these are companies that aren't great companies, but because I don't know if people appreciate how big of an of a, of a, uh, impact they run up in a fairly small, narrow group of technology companies has had on the run up in the broad market indices. It's been highly concentrated. And if there's a problem with technology, there will be a problem with the indices. Um, another area is the potential damage to pensioners and lenders, frankly, um, uh, due to underfunded state and local pensions. Um, in this lower for longer rate environment, um, more and more pensions have become more and more underfunded. And more than just an Illinois or a New Jersey or a Detroit or a Puerto Rico are moving closer to facing some type of a, either a liquidity crunch or losing the confidence of their beneficiaries. And I think that's another one to keep our eyes on as long as rates stay at these levels and returns. Another thing is, at some point, investors might take notice of the fact that we have a growing budget deficit in the United States. And a growing part of our GDP is being used to service that debt. Some brilliant person once said, that's never a concern until it's a concern. Uh, but it's all staring us in the face. And then the last thing I talk about, and um, we think about a lot at Oak Tree, is what is the impact of the accelerating growth in passive investing, ETFs, index funds, and the like, especially at the expense of active investment strategies? You know, people have looked to passive investing as sort of the low-risk, low-cost solution to how to invest well. And I guess the whole underpinnings of passive investing being good is that um, all of the active investors out there are so good that all the securities are fairly priced. So we can passively invest in all the securities where the prices have been set by the active investors. But with passive investment on the rise and becoming such a large part of the investment uh, uh, landscape, we ask the question, who's really analyzing the companies? Who's setting the passive funds asset allocations? What should we think of investors' willingness to turn over their capital to a process in which neither individual holdings nor portfolio construction is really the subject of thoughtful analysis or much of any analysis. And buying takes place regardless of price. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the effects of ETFs and other passive vehicles. The fact that today, probably about half of the US equity market is now traded daily by machines, driven mainly by momentum, and with little regard for company fundamentals. So maybe that's the, talk, maybe that's the topic of a talk another day, how that all turns out but I view it as a wild card. So against that backdrop, um, we like to say you can't predict, but you can prepare. And we're pretty public at Oak Tree that we think we're in the later innings of an up cycle. I think we've been saying we're in the eighth inning for about three years, which uh, goes to show you, as I explained to Howard Marks, that you never really know how many innings there are in a baseball game. You can go into extra innings. Um, but we, do, we, we take that, that point of view for reasons, and I want to show a few of them on the slides, the next couple of slides. So if you look on the slide here, what you see is a big, big divergence 
um, in high yield bond default rates, which are represented in the green, which are basically at all time lows. Historic high yield bond default rates about 4%, and you're hovering at 2% or less in certain periods. Um, uh, and that has diverged from the currently historic high levels of debt. Here it's expressed in the gold line as debt issued by the US corporations as a percentage of our GDP. And you can see historically um, that as corporate debt levels have increased, default rates have increased historically, 1991, 2001, 2009. But starting in 2016, something happened. The trend started to reverse. The default rate basically has continued to decrease and corporate debt levels have continued to increase. And while we can't predict what will happen, this abnormality signals to us we should be prepared, investing with an extra dose of caution, and maintaining dry powder for opportunities that lie ahead. So moving a little bit from the quantity of debt to the quality of debt, um, that's what I focus on in this slide. Um, so the top chart shows the amount of low quality debt outstanding. Here I defined it as triple C high yield bonds and triple C loans. And as you can see, those numbers are near or at all time highs. And on the chart below, uh, you can see historically the yield on high yield bonds has always reached a trough before periods of expanded distressed opportunities. And the chart shows that a trough occurred in 2014. Uh, and maybe now with yields on high yield bonds hovering around 6%, um, uh, there'll be greater opportunities lying ahead. It's hard to imagine that with upward pressure on rates, depending on how high they go, that there isn't some chance or increased chance for increased distress and defaults in the not too distant future. We like to use the analogy at Oak Tree of a fire. All of these factors I've been talking about, the high asset valuations, the low record default rates, the high inventory of low quality debt, the near historic low yields, they all act a little bit like kindling. And somewhere on that list of headwinds or uncertainties, or maybe some black swan event that smarter people than I can figure out, that could be one of the sparks uh, that lights the fire. Uh, and if a fire gets lit, we think it could be quite an inferno. Um, on this slide on the top, we look at the potential inventory of low quality debt uh, in a period of distress. What we've got here are the universe of triple C bonds and loans, and an estimate from, I believe this is one of the rating agencies, I think it could be S&P or Fitch, of the likely uh, amount of fallen angel bonds, bonds that fall from triple B rating to sub-investment grade. And if you follow the history of, of uh, fallen angel bonds, bonds rarely fall from triple B to double B and stay there. Uh, some of them act like knives and cut through the air pretty hard. And it's estimated now because of the huge growth in triple B bonds, which now stand at about two and a half trillion dollars and constitute almost half the investment grade bond index, that's the lower left, that roughly a trillion of that could fall out to fallen angel uh, status in a, in a period of what I'll call normal distress. And at the same time in the lower right, uh, we've got the fact that duration has lengthened. So if and when rates rise and we feel distress, um, uh, probably the impact on debt prices decreasing will be felt extra hard. By the way, one last thing in the upper quadrant, because people are always asking me and us at Oak Tree, you know, isn't it going to be different this time? The, so much money's been raised in the alternative investment industry. It's so much more competitive now. It's never going to be the same way in the next cycle as in the last cycle. And I agree, lots of competition. There's always been a lot of competition. The blue bars here represent the dry powder in the industry uh, allocated towards distressed debt. So you can see the relationship of the blue to the green and gold isn't that much different than in the past. And that's because so much more debt has been issued since 2008, again, to get the world's economy going again. At Oak Tree, we think we've been doing some things to get well positioned for future investment opportunities, not only having a good amount of dry powder uh, uh, and being ready for more of the distress cycle, but we've also been growing a number of what we call uh, pro-cyclical strategies. Um, uh, here on this slide, we talk about growing our multi-strategy credit product. Our real estate platform has expanded from pure opportunistic, call it private equity real estate, to more income-oriented and debt products. 
we've really built out our emerging markets platform, not only performing debt, but what we believe will be an increasing universe of opportunistic or distressed debt issued in the emerging markets. Maybe we'll be able to buy some of those Kazakhstan bonds cheap at some point in time. We acquired an infrastructure business because we believe that there's a bright future for infrastructure investing here in the United States. It's catching up to some extent to other parts of the world. Uh, we're going to need some help from the state and local governments and federal governments. And finally, direct lending to take advantage of uh, that big growth in private debt. We've been expanding the different ways we do that. No longer just mezzanine lending uh, or strategic credit. We have a separate middle market direct lending fund. And last year we entered for the first time uh, the BDC business and acquired the asset management contracts on two BDCs, uh, business development companies. And so to close, I show this slide and uh, kind of the mantra we've had at Oak Tree since 2012, which is to move forward but with caution. What we like to say at Oak Tree is that while we disavow predicting and forecasting the future, we do not disavow spending a lot of time figuring out where we think we are today. And we think where we are today is in the late innings, and we think given all the debt that's been issued, the lack of covenants, um, that distress there for reasons we can't know for sure will probably appear, and probably appear relatively suddenly. In the old days, you had financial covenants in debt. So you could bump up against breaking some covenant, and you'd have negotiation between a borrower and a lender about uh, redoing covenants. Today, the, oftentimes, the first time you know there's an issue is when somebody doesn't pay you interest or principal. That's not a good time to find out. Um, and it probably means that distress will arise more suddenly uh, in a large part of, uh, of the debt universe. Um, we see the uncertainties today as being unusual in number, in scale, and in insolubility. As I mentioned, from these levels, we see prospective returns in a lot of asset classes as lower than they've ever been. Uh, and we do think asset prices are relatively high today. And, and again, with that complacency, we see risk-taking at very high levels from our clients and from others. So we think we're living in a low return, but a very high-risk world. And that's why we said um, uh, back in 2012, we'd move forward, but with some degree of caution. It's why for the last two plus years, we've been a net seller of assets at Oak Tree, which isn't so great for the business of managing money, but I think it's very, very good for our clients whose money we manage, and it's the right thing to do in the long term. Um, on this chart, the uh, uh, gold bars are um, uh, dispositions. Uh, the green bars are funds raised. And the blue bars are, um, I'm sorry, the green bars are capital deployed, and the blue bars are funds raised. And uh, again, this is not the pattern of a normal large public asset manager where you'd probably want to show increasing amounts of funds raised, increasing amounts of funds deployed, because that translates into management fees. And we'll worry about the returns and the re return of capital later because we all know it's good. But instead, as you can see over Oak Tree's history, there's been more than one period in this last two and a half years where we've proudly returned more capital than we've invested, thinking that in the long run, um, that was a good strategy. I guess I'd close by saying we've, and acknowledging we've been pretty early in our view of being cautious, uh, having adopted it in 2012. But since 2012, we've done pretty well growing, delivering good returns to our investors and good distributions to our unit holders. Uh, we're probably tend towards being chronic worriers, um, but we believe it's essential to take note of the environment we're in. And as we see it, there's lots of reasons to be cautious. And I think we'd rather turn cautious too soon, maybe underperform for a little while, but still return positive returns, rather than do it too late after the downslide's begun, when it's going to be much, much harder to trim risk, much, much harder to achieve exits, and much, much harder to cut losses for our clients. So I think with that, if it's okay, Lori, I'll be glad to take some questions now, and then I have a few other comments maybe to close up with. So thank you very much. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the direct lending business, and why are you an attractive source of capital? Yeah, so uh, I start by saying, uh, I think that the, the, um, the general answer to the direct lending business is, in exchange for giving up some liquidity, uh, uh, you're able to get higher rate and better covenant protection. It's pretty much that simple. Um, and the environment's been very good to grow that business because so many of the regional and mid-sized banks 
have basically pulled out, and I don't think they're getting back anytime soon. It's just not how they want to allocate their capital. For Oak Tree, uh, it's really not a new activity for us. I mean, private debt uh, was part of the firm from the beginning. We just didn't call it direct lending. We called it MES. We called it strategic credit. It was part of the distressed debt group, depending on where rates and returns could be. So this whole kind of burgeoning category of direct lending, which really started with the big retail raises of uh, BDCs around 2010, 11, 12, that's what's got it titled. So now, by becoming bigger and having more pockets and pools of capital to invest, the benefit to us is we can speak for larger positions. We can originate loans and divide them between multiple pools, pools of capital and not uh, have issues with concentration in any given uh, uh, pool of capital. Um, uh, and so I think it's got a, a long legs to it, especially as long as rates stay low and spreads stay tight. I think the benefits to lenders in direct lending and to investors uh, um, are pretty easy to demonstrate. And the returns to date have been pretty good. I think a very interesting time will be coming um, because the whole BDC industry, in effect, has grown up in a period where there's never been a recession, there's never been dislocation, there's never been a high period of defaults. And for all of those who have been in the restructuring business or been in a bank, you know, large firm restructurings are a mess. Small and middle-sized restructurings can be a disaster. Uh, you know, they used to say in the regional banks, you know, if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're a lender, you know, oftentimes you, get, you just get the keys. And so I don't know that a lot of the BDCs who've been great at raising capital and sourcing loans really have the infrastructure to work out one let alone many positions. Uh, we saw that in the uh, asset, manager, asset management agreements we acquired from a, BDCs were called Fifth Street. Uh, they, were not, they were not in the first quartile of performers. And uh, amongst other things we found were a lot of positions that when they got into trouble, there was just no really great game plan on how to deal with them. So the performance continued to languish. That'll probably be a good opportunity for not the uh, direct lenders, but for some some of the other strategies at Oak Tree, like distressed debt, uh, to invest. Please. Hi. Uh, you Hi. mentioned um, covenant light, um, the movement towards covenant light loans. I was wondering, how does that, how um, how do you say the relationship between principals have, and agents have changed over um, that transition? Between principals? Let me go at it a little bit of a Investors different Investors and managers. Yeah, look, I, I think the, trade, the, the reason that covenants um, are sort of a thing of the past, at least in the public markets, is because uh, there's basically an imbalance of supply and demand. Uh, there's so many more investment grade investors who've transitioned some of their capital over to non investment grade or lower investment grade in search of yield um, uh, that they're willing to trade off. Um, the traditional protections uh, for yield. And um, of course, the banks and the, uh, uh, and the intermediaries issuing the loans, they're looking out for their clients, the borrowers. And when they can let them borrow at low cost with low, limited covenants, uh, that's what gets done. And there's been some incredible, incredibly large deals done quickly without covenants. Uh, it doesn't mean the businesses are any better. It doesn't mean the funds are any more being used to invest in the business to grow the long-term profitability and strength, just as much as the money's being used for buybacks and M&A and dividends. Uh, and it doesn't mean that at some point in time, especially if rates rise or the economy slows, it won't have problems. But it does mean that the can has been kicked much further down the road. Um, the, like I said, I think more and more you're going to see the first time borrower and talks to lender you know, shortly before they can't make a payment. And that wasn't the case when you had the sort of traditional laundry list of uh, various ratios and covenants that you were coming, coming upon breaching. So it, I think it'll be a very interesting phenomenon. I'm not looking for it to happen anytime soon. I really meant what I said about we're living in very good times in terms of the economy and business globally. And it's going to take an awful lot to slow this train down in the short run, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Hi, Jay. Hello. Um, on one of your slides, you showed a large growth of corporate debt and a low 
percentage of high yield defaults. How much of that growth of corporate debt is by companies like Apple and Microsoft where it appears they're using debt to lower their cost of capital. They're not using it for infrastructure. So if you back that out where they're fiscally strong companies, how much of a risk is that with that increase? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't have the exact percentage. I guess the, 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 the something to think about that sort of counters that is I don't think that triple B rated bonds, not that the rating agencies are all knowing, have ever constituted just shy of 50% of the investment grade bond universe. So um, while what you say very strong companies may have been issuing more debt and less equity, um, uh, in terms of a percentage of what's outstanding, it's tilted towards the lowest rated companies. Um, and, and so I, I, but we'll see how, see how it all plays out. All right. Thanks, Thanks for the question. Yeah, please. Yeah, the question was a comment on Chinese bank debt or uh, non-bank financial corporations debt and, and potential impact on the economy. So um, uh, China has been a great place, at least for Oak Tree to do business. And it's like a tale of two cities. It's a great, been a great place to raise money. And I think that's only going to get better uh, because they're, they are opening up their more allocations uh, to alternatives, not just from the sovereign wealth funds, but now we're seeing it more with um, high net worth distribution and insurance companies. On the debt side, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, these are wrong statistics. I guess I would just say, I believe that debt outstanding in China since the global financial crisis has increased seven times. Uh, the size of the Chinese banking industry, bank assets, I think are $40 trillion. The US banking industry is $18 trillion. Um, much of the, the amount of what they call non-performing and special mention loans, that's their term for kind of watch list, is very low. Um, and um, a large part of that is because more debt is issued to stimulate the economy. At some point, it's our view uh, that there won't necessarily be big, some big bubble or some big credit collapse in China. But in our view, there'll be a more normalized rate of default and a sorting out of the stronger companies from the weaker companies. And if you apply sort of a traditional, again, default rate, two, three, four percent against that denominator of debt outstanding, I think the opportunities there for distressed investors uh, could be quite significant in the years ahead. We've been planning for that. That's our fastest growing region. That's where we've been planting the flag in more offices, moving more people there, both investment people and marketing people and client relations people, building relationships with sourcers sources of deals, and a lot with servicers of assets. Um, we want to do business with Chinese partners, contrary to what we hear about on television, not as not on our own. Uh, there, uh, anywhere you operate around the globe, at least in many parts, it's great to have a good partner. Uh, but the opportunity set is going to be very, very significant. And a lot of it depends on at what pace and when the government chooses to slow down, in effect, lending and relending and re-relending to borrowers, many of which are state-owned enterprises, and many of which you know, are not all the strongest companies. Um, we see the same opportunity building in India. Uh, uh, there they've got a new bankruptcy and insolvency code that is sort of in a beta test with, I think they identified 24 high-profile uh, restructuring companies. They want to show the world that they can work through the system. And interestingly, and we pay a lot of attention to the laws and the courts, but in China thus far, uh, they've made tremendous progress in their bankruptcy code, in effect, their insolvency regulations, and, and in the enforcement of contracts, which will attract more and more foreign capital for the opportunity. I'd be very surprised if that didn't happen in India also, uh, but they're just a bit behind China. Thank you. Yes. Um, you, you talked about capital raising and uh, an increasingly global focus with China and India being natural sources of liquidity and in investing. But as you think about the pressures on, on investing <clears throat> in what's hopefully performing debt, uh, and you think about an emerging economy world where there's clearly 
growth that's more global away from the U.S. and developed economies. How do you think about origination, you know, in emerging markets and, you know, the appetite for, for issuance, um, you know, in, in emerging economies and other less traditional markets when you think about portfolio and you think about growth? Uh, well, I think it's extraordinary, the opportunities there. We, we um, again, our main focus has been on uh, emerging market corporate debt. We're not, a, we're not a sovereign emerging market investor. Uh, by the way, and we also have a liquid emerging market equity strategy, but sticking with the debt. Uh, the amount of debt that's been issued in some of the strange places I mentioned on extraordinary terms is remarkable. The amount of it that's dollar denominated, which is not always focused on, is larger than people think. And one of the big benefits to the emerging market debtors of a weak dollar, which is where we've been for a while, is it makes that look like a good bet. But uh, the dollar strengthens, which we don't predict or not predict, then the same amount of debt gets a lot more expensive really fast. Um, and again, uh, I think if some of the other things on my uh, headwinds or uncertainty column, like if things did slow down in China, if there was some version of I don't know about trade wars, kind of, uh, maybe not the right word. You know, there'd be a lot of other parts of the world that catch a cold pretty quickly. And uh, I think there could be some extraordinary opportunities again at debt that we'll look back and say, how did that ever make sense uh, in the future? But for now, that's not my prediction. We have a strong, growing world economy. And um, I'm sure it's just all going to be great until it isn't. But, but your, your answer is, suggests that it's, more opportunistic and trending toward distrust as opposed to a systematic, you know, well, well, origination for, program where there where you feel like the rest of the world is driving, you know, more and more issuance that could be of yeah. reasonable quality. I think that's probably right. With the caveat that if I, if we saw the terms upon which the call it performing emerging market debt is being issued as reflecting the incremental risks involved in some of the uh, uh, foreign countries, then I think we'd be much more interested. I mean, it's really one of the other things we like to say at Oak Tree, there's really no good assets and there's no bad assets. There's just assets at different prices. So the, the, the greatest quality company overpriced isn't so great and vice versa. So I think it's sort of the same way with uh, the relationship between uh, the issuer and the price. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you've warned the group against the dangers of trying to predict the future, but you've also said that you spend a lot of time thinking about our current circumstances. Uh, what are some of the uh, early warning signs or canaries in the coal mine that you're watching for? Yeah, well, some of the things I see, as I, for certainly we all see volatility pick up. We all see a flattening yield curve, which sometimes means something, sometimes doesn't. Um, uh, we see some of these... Uh, I call odd risk-taking behaviors. You know, the, uh, um, some of the emerging market debt statistics I gave, the divergence between default rates and debt outstanding, the concentration of, per of performance in some of the broad stock indices in a very narrow band of issues. The FANG stocks are a good example of that. You know, uh, sometimes people go, like to go back and talk about the Nifty 50, which was nifty, but then, then it wasn't. Uh, these, are, these are some of the things that, that, that we see uh, right now. And the biggest for me is it's just, I just feel there's upward pressure on interest rates. Um, and I feel that generally that will slow things down. Maybe that will slow things down in a very orderly fashion. And we won't run into a distressed circumstance. But um, there's a lot of people in our industry that have never, never been in the industry when there was a, any kind of a recession and have certainly never been in the industry when there's been any kind of uh, 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 dislocation or distress. I'm not sure if everybody's really prepared for, for what's to come. There are others here that have probably seen it, and it's a very different environment. But those are some of the, some of the early things we think about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over the last uh, 35 years, including like since Oak Tree's foundation, in, even though we've had cycles of interest rates moving up and down, the longer trend has been pretty much straight down since 1980. 
Um, how would Oak Tree adjust if we had a uptrend with newer highs and higher lows in interest rates and how that affect like your approach as a credit investor? Yeah, I, I think that certain of our strategies, well, first of all, it's, Oak Tree is no different than all the other asset managers represented here <laughs> elsewhere. A big increase in interest rates, all things equal, generally bad for all fixed income investors, who, for stuff we've already owned. So everybody's gonna feel that pain in the short run if it occurs. The question is how do you react to that? How do you take advantage of the opportunities that come from that? And I think that's really the whole history of Oak Tree, especially our, our opportunistic funds. You know, fortunately at Oak Tree, unlike where I used to be at a large insurance company, we don't have a balance sheet with two sides. We don't have to match, try to figure out how to match up the assets and the liabilities. What we have to do is to keep delivering superior results with the assets pretty much in any environment uh, on an absolute basis and relative to our competition. So I think you'll see who's been investing with a higher degree of caution, with a greater margin for error, uh, who stayed away from uh, some of maybe the most aggressive types of investments. That will all probably be seen, was it another Warren Buffettism, you know, we, you'll see who's wearing a bathing suit when the tide goes out, or something like that. That's a bad, bad visual, but uh, you'll see it. Um, it's pretty hard to see that today when, when really, um, in large part, we've had straight up markets since 2009. I think we're getting close to if we, we've never had an expansion and a longer period of uh, uh, a longer cycle without a recession than I think a little over 10 years. And I think 10 year anniversary will be in about 12 months from now. So maybe we'll hit new historic levels we've never seen before, uh, but maybe not. T time will tell. Good. I think that's all of our questions. Good. All righty. Thank you.